Good morning, Holiday. Good morning. I wish that I could just go reach out and hug every one of you. I've missed you so much, but it's so good to be back here with my family at Holiday and, and all the uh, help and support we get and my family gets from you guys. You'll have to excuse my use of water this morning. Tommy said you must, you said you're like an old heifer. You must have got <laughs> shipping sickness or something coming back. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through it, like I say, and uh, we, we just love being here. I bring you greetings and salutations from the Rifle Congregation in, in Colorado. And rifles, uh, they're small, but uh, they, they were full of love and they worship God in spirit and spirit. <laughs> And you know as well as I do, when you're traveling and you find people of the same like faith, it is so comforting and, and it lifts you up and it inspires you uh, to, to do better, uh, as, as we say. Today I have a two-verse sermon. It may have three topics, so Jonah says that's always a good way to do it. But uh, two verses from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And uh, the topic is a love that can hate. I don't know everybody say, well, what is that about? Well, we'll find out. A love that can hate. Verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Let's take verse 9 first. Simply stated or simply put, love or life, love must be sincere. It must be sincere. Hate what is evil in the world. And we have a lot of evil in the world today. And cling to what is good. Maybe some of the things that we don't cling to enough. Our love must be real. Paul had a question about our love. It seems that there's a strong tendency many times for us to put on a face. Or to have a false love or concern for others around about us. Christians must have an honest love. Paul says without dissimulation, which is just a big word for professing falsely our hypocrisy, have a love of hypocrisy. Jesus himself, you know, uh, in his daily dealings with his apostles, he ate with them, he slept with them, he traveled with them, but yet what? He was deceived and, 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 and betrayed by a kiss from Judas. Jesus himself was betrayed. Do we have honest, genuine love for others? Are we concerned about those who are lost? That's kind of what we want to get in on right there. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. We really, we, we all familiar with that. Jesus many times demonstrated his love for the lost. Do we have that in our hearts today? Do we have a love for those people who are lost? The people it's not, we love each other, that's, that's easily done. But what about the people who are lost, the ones that's not here today? In Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus, when he sat down and eat with these people, did not sit down to tell these people that they were all right, do what you're doing now, just continue in your sins. 
He did it because he loved their souls and he was concerned about their lives and eternity. We want to show them a better way. That's what he was wanting to do. A better and the fuller meaning of what life is all about. You know, we've heard it said, and I think Johnny's one that said it, you know, people really don't care how much you know until what? They know how much you care. We've got to extend that love to those people who are lost around us, in our family, our neighbors, people that we have business with, you know. If it comes up, we should bring that up, and we need to try to show them a better way of life, a better way of life that will lead to life eternal. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus loved the people that he, uh, that he was eating with, but he didn't condone what they were doing. He was trying to lead them to a better light of what the love of God, a better way, an example of how to live life. We all need to strive to have true love in our lives for our fellow Christians and sinners alike. Sometimes I think we've lost our zeal about seeking the lost. You know, we just kind of uh, get here and we're, we're having church and we're, we're doing okay and, and, and we forget about the mission that we have been uh, delivered to. Look at Christ's life and what He did. He was continually trying to reach the lost. Shouldn't we have the mind of Christ? To try to help those around without us. He came to seek and save the lost. In Luke chapter 15 beginning with verse 3. He told two different parables about this. So that, you know when, when God says something one time. That's important. When he emphasizes it by two times. We nearly need to listen up and to, and to listen. But in Luke chapter 15 Jesus told them about a parable. Suppose someone had a hundred sheep and he lost one of them. Does he leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Well, yes, he does, doesn't he? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and he goes home and he calls his friends and neighbors in. And he said, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same manner there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine righteous persons who do not need repentance. Jesus loves you. He's here with us today. We know that. He is in our presence as we worship Him. But, you know, have we ever thought about Jesus is really concerned about the neighbor that's at home? Or the person that's sleeping late this morning and didn't come to church. Or maybe your friend that you work with that has no inkling of what kind of love God has to share with him. We need to think about these things because it was very important to Jesus. So it should be very important to us. Again, in the same chapter, beginning in verse 8, parable about a woman who loses her ten silver, who had loses one of her ten silver coins. She searched till she found it, and when she found it, he, she called her friends and neighbors together and rejoiced with her. Jesus compares the woman's joy to the joy that angels feel when sinners repent. You know, we know when there's rejoicing in heaven, when we have one who comes forward and and, and, and repents of sins or obeys the, the uh, gospel call, there's rejoicing in heaven. That's how much every person in this world is loved and thought of, the lost people. And even when we, when we talked about in class this morning, there's even rejoicing when you go to bed at night and you, you bow your head and you ask for forgiveness. You have a great cheering squad on your behalf in heaven that's cheering you on and, and saying, yes, that's the right thing to do. God illustrates about how He feels about the lost in the world. We should uh, be concerned too. We find love in our hearts for the lost and I think we need to challenge ourselves as far as that goes. Also in verse 9 we sign a poor 
that which is evil, or hate evil. A love that can hate. <laughs> hate the evil in the world. Hate the sin that takes people away from the love of the Father for it has for His children. The evil in this world seems like it's getting more and more. Uh, it destroys families. It uh, takes friends away. It destroys our children many times. A worldly lifestyle or excesses of sin. Uh, it seems the world is being deceived by evil. But we need to see evil for what it truly is and hate that evil that's in the world. We need to see evil in the world for what it truly is. It's dangerous. It's divisive. It's a lie. It will promise the world and, 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 and lead our young people in thinking that this is the way to live and this is the way to, to be. But it's a lie. It's not true. It leads to a downfall. The first part of the chapter, uh, Paul emphasizes to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Don't change and be like the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this only can come through our dedication to prayer and knowledge of the scriptures and, and uh, helping others. Paul throughout the chapter exhorts us to be better Christians and continually seek God's will. Abhor evil. Hate the evil in the world. We don't hate the sinner, but we hate the sin that takes our brothers and sisters and our children away from us. And a God who loves them so much. I don't think that I can... Almost every family I meet has some sad story about some part of their family where the evil has taken them away from the family or taken them away from the loved ones. <clears throat> you know, we don't hate those family members, but we, we should find in our heart a resolve to hate that evil that took them away and see it for what it is because the world as it is today presents it as a lifestyle. It presents it as just an alternative. You know what I mean? You know, if you want to take drugs, you know, that's part of it. And we saw that in Colorado. You know what I mean? They, they, it's accepted. It's just part of life. And that's wrong. We need to hate the evil world just like we hate cancer. We hate strokes, heart attacks, sicknesses. We hate those things because that takes people away from us. We need to hate that sin that is, that's what we are to hate in this world. And how we react to it, we're exposed to it every day. The sinful temptations at work and influences that we have in our friends that are worldly. We have it at play even in the safety of our own homes. The music that we listen to, the TV, if you watch TV lately, even the newscast, you know, just about, to, you know, it just, it, I just can't understand how that the whole world can see wrong as right. But it's there. Gone are the Andy Griffith days when everything ended good, had a good moral to store. Gone are the Westerns where the, you know, the good guys wore the white hats and the black guys, you know, you could always figure out who was good and bad. Today, it's not that way. We need to watch out for the evils of the world. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. We look and we find that even Isaiah said, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. In Romans, Paul told us in chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise that we can't fool. Do you ever see that in the world today? I mean, do you ever watch the news and just wonder how that they can think that this is right? <clears throat> Professing themselves to be wise that they came from. <clears throat> this hatred of evil is so very important for us as Christians. Clinging to the good is necessary for an honest love to be truthful. If we aren't careful, we can our love 
can easily lose its purity by being exposed over and over and we can accept it and divert <laughs> the nature of our love. We can easily cover up for evil. Oh, it's not that bad. Everybody's doing it. You know what I mean? Uh, I, you know, I feel strange not doing it. You know, but the world changes. Okay? The world changes. It's not the same world we grew up, our grandparents. <laughs> Think about if your dad or mom uh, has passed away or your grandparents was here and saw what was happening today, what would they think? What would they think? The world changes all the time. But I'm here to tell you, God does not change. He does not change. Hebrews 13 and 8, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our youth, I worry about them so much because they are exposed to evil in the world all the time. Their friends are not coming from families that are church families, are not even acknowledging God, and they're growing up in a generation that is godless, basically. Uh, the, in the school, they're faced with all of their teammates, their co-workers. Everyone is doing it. And another thing that they have to come to is the media. You know what I mean? See this thing? The kids are hanging around. Look, they can see all over the world and they feel alienated that they're strange because they're trying to live a good life. We need to talk to our children and tell them the correct ways and how to fear what is evil in it today. Just like Paul warns us, like we mentioned in Romans chapter 2 and verse, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but transform ourselves. We have to do this. Even though everyone is doing it, it doesn't make it right. Yes, hate the evil, but we must reach out to God with love to his lost children. Because it is so and very important to him. It's important to Jesus. That's why he came down and suffered on the cross was to save these people who are lost. We've got to expose them to that. We should never look down on people with trouble in their life, whether it be drugs, alcohol, whatever lifestyle that took them away from our God. We need to love those people and try to expose the evil that's in the world. Hate and abhor these things that took these good people away from God's grace. And also we find in that verse, cling to what is good. There's so much evil, we must get closer to what is right. One scripture come to my mind, and I guess it's because I'm just read it, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Christian, the Christian graces, Peter tells us that we can add these gifts and you can share and be closer to God and we can escape the ruin that comes from the people of the world today. Beginning with verse Five in Second Peter chapter one, and beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue or goodness. You know what I mean? We're always looking for good people. These good people. You know what I mean? There's not too many good people seem like left sometimes in the world. You can find them, but we need to be good ourselves. And to this goodness, add knowledge. Even in the Old Testament, it was said. That our people are destroyed by the lack of knowledge of the Word of God. How can we do it without God's direction? How can you uh, do this life without looking to God and His knowledge and His insight on how to act? And to this knowledge we have self-control. Seems like lust is a thing that is just do what you want to do. If it feels good, do it. That is the world's attitude about everything. And so many people uh, have lost their self-control. Add to this temperance or self-control, patience. We all need patience. We all need patience. Godliness or devotion to God. We can understand what devotion means when we're hard at a job or something. You've got to show up at these times and you're usually <coughs> devoted to that, right? Right? Because you know if you don't go to work, you're not going to get paid, right? But when it comes to church, we don't understand what devotion is. You know, we're just here and there, and, and if we come, we can. And we need to develop devotion in our lives. 
in good godliness, with devotion, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, or charity. For if these things be in you and abide, they make you that you neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacked these things is blind and cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never fail. Cling to these good things. Now let's go on to verse 10. Now we need to consider our love how it's manifested toward our brethren, toward work, toward ourselves. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring the other. Love each other in a way that makes you feel close like brothers and sisters. You need to try to give others more honor than yourself. And that's very hard sometimes for people to do who are selfish, now, there's no place for I this and I that. We, need, we are here together as brothers and sisters. Genuine love is the bedrock of our Christian walk. It's the glue that holds us together. It's the love that makes us go through the storms of life and come out on the other side. You know, this building would be a very dangerous building to be in today if it wasn't for that cement and these bricks and walls in this. If they were just stacked up, you know, I don't think, I think we need to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? But it's got that cement that holds it together and makes it strong. If we have love one to another, that will hold us strong. Amen. It will hold us strong through storms of life and troubles and torments. And, and I'd like to say, folks, and it's not going to happen here, but it will happen here. We will have trouble days. We will have storms. And the love that we have for each other, that's going to hold us together. That's going to make us strong in the life. Uh, Paul calls us to love our Christians with genuine love, not just words only, but with actions. Treat others like family. Not trying to outdo one another, and not a competition, but always be ready to show love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, what? If you have what? Love for one another. I'm so proud of holiday because we are known for our love. And I feel love when I'm here. And we talked about that a lot this morning in our class. We talked about the love that we have and how that you can feel the love many times when you go into a congregation. You see people hugging and and, and, you know, wishing everybody well. And then some places, you know, you don't see that as much. But it's the love that will hold us together. Uh, love and know who's missing. Love and know who needs something. You know what I mean? If, you're, if you love people, then you're, you're communicating with them. You're finding out what their needs are. You're trying to help them up in times of stress and times of trouble and sickness. Uh, that knits us together to stand against all these bad times that can come. We need to have God-centered edification as we gather to worship. We should lift each other up. That's what we come here to do, to lift each other up in the Word of Christ and, and, and service to Him. Challenge each other. Develop a zeal for loving each other. We need to have that in our heart that we're going to come here and try to reach out and love those around about us, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help your neighbor. Express your love every time you come here. You know, there's nothing wrong with telling people that you love them. That lifts people up. That's what we need in this world. We need to encourage those who are elderly and with troubled times. We need to be a good listener. Tish says, I need to do that a little more. <laughs> Don't talk so much. Why don't you listen to them? <laughs> but we need, we need that. You know, a lot of times, that's all somebody needs if somebody will just sit and listen. You know what I mean? You don't have to give them answers to everything, but sometimes that helps them just to get it off their chest, just to, to, to have someone to listen. Encourage our young people. 
Oh my goodness. You think it was hard raising kids back in your day? I would I would not, I mean, God bless all of you young couples that's in here raising kids now. They got their stuff cut out for them. You know, and God bless them. We should be there to encourage these, not only the younger people, the smaller ones, but in, encourage our young couples to, to do what's right. Encourage them. Give them compliments. And encourage. Uh, don't, not with just empty words, but mean it. You know, if there's something you can do. Use our talents. A lot of people say, well, I don't have no talents. We can all do something. And I can think of so many people. I hate to start mentioning people because I'll leave some people out. But even as a small child, I can remember uh, going to church at Harrogate. And I don't even remember what the, uh, the old man's name was. He's a Bobby. But every every Sunday after church, he waited till after church. Uh, he would have a stick of juicy fruit gum for every child. And you know, after church we'd all go. But see, that made it. I remember that to this day. See, little things that you can do like that can influence people. You know, and can make them uh, remember and, and remember the good in the world. Use our talents. Phones, cards, letters. And then I, I'm thinking, you know, some of the people we're going to miss, I'm going to miss Betty Smile. You know what I mean? And if you know Betty, you know what I'm talking about. She'd always, you'd always tell her something, she'd give you that beautiful smile. It'll be all right. I miss her coleslaw. I miss her banana pudding. <laughs> her peach cobbler. Uh, I miss Diane Phillips' pie. You know, a lot of people didn't know anything about Diane Phillips always putting, she's past now, but she's always putting pies over here and, uh, and, and we'd be given out to the people who needed it. And Sharon Reed, bless her heart, she'd give us a little package before we left. We opened it and it was all wrapped up so nice and banana bread <coughs> and forks and napkins and everything. Just little things like that. It makes people special to us. We need to be a church of love. I can't vaguely remember. I'm very small, but uh, 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 when I was very small, we went to Madison Church, and that was back when Ira North was there. And I know that every Sunday he would have a love feast. And uh, before they started service, he said, "Now I want you to get up and go talk to somebody you don't usually talk to." Don't go to, you know, somebody you know. That's easy. Go to somebody that you don't know. And it would be three to five minutes. People just up milling around like we do before church. But that brought love into that congregation. And we also need to find time to pray more. Ourselves. Not just prayers here at church. But to pray more. And study the scriptures. That's where the power is. You can sit and listen to me or Bob or Johnny all your life and not find out what you really, truly need to know until you open that Bible for yourself and study it. People are going to be very surprised one of these days because ignorance is not innocence. Did you know? Did you hear that? Ignorance is not innocence. Being a Christian is more than what we believe or how many times we go to church in a week. We've got to be active in doing what God has for His plan. So there's my three points, Dr. John. Love and have concern for the lost in this world. Hate the evil in the world. Not the sinners, but hate the evil in the world and see it for what it is. Many times we just pass it over and laugh at it. But it's evil. It's taking people away. <coughs> and love our brothers and sisters with all the love that we can muster. The lesson's yours this morning. If you have any need, if you need to come back to the church, repent of sins, or maybe some sins of omission or commission, whichever one it is, or if you need to obey the gospel, won't you come as together we stand and say?